Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, do you like to say you're sorry? Do you find it fun to apologize? I'm guessing that most of you would say no. Many of us find it hard to apologize. And why? It's because by doing so, we make ourselves vulnerable to others. We fear that if we admit our guilt, if we admit we've done something wrong, then it can be held against us. Do you like to share your faith with others? What about when you're picked on for it? What if you were being tortured for believing in Jesus? Would you find it easy to witness to others about Jesus? Today, God encourages us through the Apostle Peter, telling us that it's easy to apologize to God. It's easy to say, I'm sorry to God, because we already know how God's going to respond according to his mercy and love, which we don't deserve. We know he's going to forgive us for Jesus' sake. And our baptism reassures us of this. And it's as we realize this, this forgiveness that is ours full and free, then it becomes easier for us to share our faith with others. Let's listen once again to God's words of encouragement through the Apostle Peter for us today. 1 Peter 3, verses 15 through 22. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Again, here we have God through Peter reminding us that it's easy for us to apologize to God, to say we're sorry. And why? Because we don't have any fear of God's wrath or the condemnation for our sins. Peter tells us, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Jesus paid once for all that debt that you and I owe for our sins. Think of all those things we do wrong from the littlest gossip, at least in our eyes, to the greatest thing we've done wrong that fills us with guilt to this day. All those sins that we've done by keeping our mouth silent when the opportunity was there to share our faith with others. All those sins cried out for hell's punishment. And yet, what did Jesus do? He took that punishment on himself on the cross to take those sins away. So now we are forgiven in Jesus. And even more than that, Jesus rose from the dead. Peter tells us he was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. Easter is the proof that that payment that Jesus made was enough to take our sins away. You could say that Easter is God's receipt to us, that salvation is ours. And then that glorious God of grace gave us faith to receive all those blessings Christ won for us. And he gave us faith through our baptism. As Peter tells us, baptism that now saves you also 
not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Baptism saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And look what he's telling us about baptism. Your baptism, my baptism. <coughs> baptism is not just a simple ceremony. It's not just something that's symbolic. It's not just an act of obedience towards God. No, it's God's act of mercy toward us. Through baptism, the Holy Spirit creates and strengthens faith in our hearts so we can see all Jesus has done. And even though it defies our logic and reason, it works trust in our hearts to cling to Jesus' cross, knowing that's what saves us. It's the means by which God gives his grace to us. When Martin Luther was finding his life filled with despair or danger or temptation, he looked to his baptismal certificate that he had hanging on his wall. And then he would say, I am baptized. That baptism of his was his source of comfort and hope. And it's your and my source of comfort and hope, too. Now look at the beautiful picture of baptism that the Apostle Peter uses here in our text. He speaks about Noah's ark. That ark was the vessel that saved and rescued the few faithful believers when the rest of the world, all the living creatures, were destroyed. That flood brought death to so many. But that ark lifted the few believers above the destroying waters and saved them. And God uses baptism, our baptism, as a vessel that saves us too, saves us from the destruction of hell, because in baptism, God lifts us up above his rage and our sins, because through baptism, we've been brought to faith and given the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us. So as you come to the Lord in confession, as you come apologizing for your sins, as you come to the Lord saying how sorry you are for them, plead your baptism. When you face and battle Satan, temptation, sinful feelings, and your sinful nature, use your baptism. Say, I am baptized. I'm a child of God. That baptism of yours gives you your identity. And maybe... A good thing for you to do would be to take out your baptismal certificate and put it on the wall like Martin Luther did. Let it be there for you to look at as a reminder to whom you belong, to your Lord, to your God, and to your Savior. Baptism, so important. Look up for a moment at the ceiling. Look up at it. What's it look like? Does it look like the inside of a ship turned upside down? Does it look perhaps like the ark? That's no coincidence. The place where you're sitting right now is called the nave in church architect. You're sitting in the nave as opposed to the narthex, which is the back of church, the entryway, or the sacristy over here, where the bread and wine of the Lord, for the Lord's Supper are kept. You're sitting in the nave. And nave is a word from which we get the word navy. Nave means ship. And as you sit here in God's house and connect yourself to God's word and sacrament, you are being kept safe, as it were, in the ark of God's grace. Yes, by your baptism, God created faith in your heart. And that faith knows the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. It trusts in it. It clings to it for eternal life. It clings to it for the truths that are there, 
that Christ died and paid for your sins there at the cross, that he rose again as proof that your sins are gone, and that through baptism, Christ has made you his own. So again, the Lord is saying it's easy to apologize to God. Take your sins to him. Ask for forgiveness. Ask from the bottom of your hearts and know with certainty that you are forgiven because of all Jesus has done for you. Then once you've confessed your sins and been assured of your forgiveness, take the opportunities that come your way to share your faith with others. Both the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, and the KJV, the King James Version of the Bible, put verse 15 into these words. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer. But in the Greek, it literally says, always be prepared to give an apology for the hope that you have. Always be ready to give an apology. Is the Greek here saying that you need to apologize for your faith in Jesus Christ? That you need to tell people, I'm sorry, I have hope in Christ? Not at all. The Greek word there, apologia, literally means a word towards or a defense of. And what Peter is telling us to do is always be prepared to give a defense of the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. Always be prepared to tell others about Jesus and to defend the truths of Jesus. As they ask you, why are you the way you are? Why do you live the way you do? Apologize in the way of giving a defense of that. And the thing is, you are prepared to do that. Every single one of you is prepared to do that very thing because you know what God has done for you in Christ. We just talked about it. He died on the cross and paid for your sins. He rose from the dead, proved positive your sins are gone. And baptism reassures you of that. You know what God has done for you in Christ. You can give that defense and tell others, give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. And why is that so important? Why is that basically the first thing Peter tells us to do here? Well, imagine you're fishing on the ocean in a boat. Suddenly a storm comes up and churns the sea into a frenzy. The swells and the waves come against the boats that are out there. And the boats are sinking. People are jumping off, abandoning ship. But you're in a ship that's unsinkable. You're safe. And there's plenty of room in your ship. You see all these people swimming desperately. Wouldn't it be heartless of you to look at them in the water, knowing that if they didn't get any help, they would drown? And yet you sail away, leaving them swimming there? In the same way, there are countless souls around us dying every day. And most of them are going to hell because they don't know their Lord and Savior. But we're in the ark. We're in that unsinkable ark. It can't be sunk by sin, death, or hell. And there's plenty of room. So let's tell others what God has done for them in Christ. Let's tell others about the wonderful hope that we have. And it's hope that isn't on our own strength and goodness, but on Jesus and what he has done. Let's rescue them from the sea of guilt and sin so that they don't end up dying in hell. And as you do this, don't just tell people what God has done for you. Tell people what God has done for you in Christ. 
Now, God may have helped you in so many ways with your life right now. He may have helped you quit smoking, quit drinking. He may have helped you become a better parent or better spouse. He may have helped you make the team or pass the test. All wonderful things. But if you tell others what God has done for you, just these earthly things, what happens when you slip up? What happens when you go back to smoking or drinking, when you're not the perfect parent or spouse, or when you don't pass the test or make the team? If all you've been doing is talking about how God helps you in this life, wouldn't your friends then imply from these slip-ups that God doesn't care for you or God isn't with you? No, tell others what Christ has done for you or what God has done for you in Christ. In gentleness and respect, tell them all that he has done to save you from your sins, his death, his resurrection, the fact that he suffered the very hell you deserve. Tell them what Christ has done for you and how that motivates you then to live for him and how Christ is there for you even in life's slip-ups. Even if you do begin smoking again or aren't the perfect parent, the Lord is still there to forgive you and hold to you. And as you tell them what the Lord has done for you in Christ, then tell them he's done the same for them. The same Jesus who died for me, he died for you. The same Jesus who's taken my sins away, he's taken your sins away too. Believe in him. Because then they'll find it easier to apologize to God, to confess their sins, to bring their sins to him. And with that Holy Spirit worked faith, they'll be heaven bound just as you are. Imagine you go out and buy a new car. You go to a dealership, and you get this wondrous deal on a new car, cheaper than you could buy used. It's a beautiful car. You're just so happy, so happy with the purchase, so happy with the price. You drive around, and people come to you, and they say, great wheels, looks great. What do you do? Well, you go right into that tirade telling them where you got it, the cheap price you got it. This is the salesman. You got to go see him. You got to go get the same deal I got. We've been given something wonderful. Salvation. We don't deserve it. But God's given to us salvation. How much do we have to pay for it? Not a thing. A free gift from our Lord. The most glorious thing of all. Life eternal in heaven. Tell others about it. As they see you living your faith, dealing with adversity with even joy because you know the Lord is by your side, and then they ask you, how can you be the way you are? Tell them of the hope you have in Jesus. Here's the difference Jesus makes for me. As excitedly as you would talk about that new car, tell them what Jesus has done for you. And then tell them this is what Jesus has done for them too. It's easy to apologize, both to confess our sins to our Lord and to make a defense of what he has done, because we know what he's done, and we rejoice in it. Amen.